Okay, continuing on the uh, review packet for the second quarter uh, cumulative test for Math 4. Uh, we left off with number 15, and we're going to go down to number 16, um, where we are looking at um, this particular uh, uh, lineup of numbers where, you know, X represents the number of hours studying, Y represents the test score. Now, um, we're going to look at the R squared values on all five of these. I, I want you to put all five of those uh, equations in there and see what the result is. All right, after having plugged in the data and plugged in all five of those equations, these were the numbers that you should have gotten, 0.9335. The linear was not was an all right fit. The quadratic looked even better. And the exponential looked even better than that. The logarithmic was not quite as good as some of the others. But when we go to looking at the graph themselves, all right, we see the scatter part of the scatter plot of the green dots uh, of, uh, you know, as far as the pattern of studying hours versus the grade that you're going to get. Now, I, you know, I'm not sure that the, the linear is quite the best fit because if you notice, there's a bit of a curve to this. So, you know, the line straight line may not be the best fit. Well, if we go with the parabola, that's actually a, a pretty close fit right there. But the problem is, is that there's this point of diminishing returns that uh, the highest grade you're ever going to get is an 84. And that's after seven and a half hours of studying. After that, you start going down again. I would like to think that with a little bit more study, you might actually get better than an 84. So we're going to pass on that one. <clears throat> the next one is the exponential. Um, which is actually not bad. Uh, now, when I pull back a bit, though, it still looks like, according to the exponential model, the best grade you're going to get is still an 87. Um, I, 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 I'm a little more optimistic than that. So let's see what everybody else has to offer. Now, the logarithmic has a similar curve, but it kind of sweeps up. And I'm not sure quite how I feel about that, because especially uh, when you start zooming back out again, uh, you know, it allow you know, you spend 40 hours, you'll make 102. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to agree with that or not. And then there's the sine curve, which actually looks very much like the parabola, uh, has the same numbers as the parabola, but again, it peaks out at about 84 and uh, starts going back down again. So I'm, 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 I'm going to reject that one. Right now, the only two that seem to be reasonably close uh, to what we were looking at was either the exponential, which is the purple, or, uh, no, excuse me, the, the uh, logarithmic is the purple, the exponential is the green. Um, now, here you have to make a hard decision. Um, you have to decide, even though, well, let's see now, the green one is the exponential. It has the highest R squared value of any of them. But it's also telling you that at the rate you're going, you're not going to get much better than an 84, or an 87, rather. Um, you know, if, if and I'm, I'm trying to remember how the question was asked, uh, to score a 90, you're not going to. Uh, it doesn't look like you're going to. Um, is even if you stretch it out here, you know, you, you would have to spend thousands of hours <laughs> to get your 90. Uh, I have a feeling, but I'm less comfortable with the idea that, um, you know, you spend more than 30 hours on it and you'll get above 100 which you know most tests i know of you know you, you can't count on extra credit 
And so 100 is going to be the highest score. So there's a part of me that is saying that the, the exponential is your best bet here. Um, it has the highest R squared value, and it also has reasonable answers. But what it, the answers are telling you is, is that 87 is as good as it gets. Um, so that, that's probably going to be our response here, is that we're going to choose the exponential. But you also have to note that you probably not score above 87, just according to the values that they've given so far. So that's that one. Now we're going to do some trig problems and uh, some good old fashioned Sokotoa. As we'll go ahead and get that in there. And so uh, if that is, well, we, we've, we've answered this question before that uh, even though the 80 is on a different triangle, this 12 can also go down here. Those are alternate interior angles on horizontal parallel lines. So now the question is how far above sea level is the observer in the lighthouse? You're looking for X there. So we're going to go through and label it from the perspective of the 12 degrees. That's my opposite. This is my hypotenuse. And this is my adjacent. And so my two players are opposite and adjacent. That's X and 80. Um, tangent uses opposite and adjacent. So we're going to say tangent of 12. Opposite goes on top. Adjacent goes on the bottom. Now, if I want to get x by itself, I'm going to have to multiply by 80. And so 80, 10, 12 is going to be my value for x. According to the calculator, it's going to be right at 17, like 17.0045 or something like that. Okay, next one, looks like we are still dealing with a tangent situation. That is my cat hollering in the background. As he says, I'm not feeding him fast enough. It's still 15 minutes, so I should be able to finish this video first. All right, so um, from the perspective of theta, this is my opposite. This is my hypotenuse. This is my adjacent. We are still playing with opposite and adjacent, which is tangent. So the tangent of theta is opposite 20 over adjacent 30. Now, anytime that you don't know what the uh, degree measure is, that is where you go second tangent. And your screen is going to do that. And you're going to punch in the 20 divide 30 inside and close the parentheses. Don't forget to close the parentheses. And we get a 33.7, which would be the measure of A. All right, now anytime you have a word problem with an angle of depression, it is my recommendation that you draw a rectangle with a diagonal. Because if you have your plane and you have the airport, and the plane is coming in for a landing, and it is using a seven degree angle of depression. Well, we did this last time. That means that these are alternate interiors, and this guy is 7 degrees also. Now, um, it is 3 miles, of, the plane is 3 miles above the ground. And so they want to know what is the ground distance from, you know, if, if, if somebody fell out of the plane right there, how far would they have to walk to the airport? All right. Um, and, of course, that is going to be happening at a right angle. 
So we go through and we mark off from the angle, uh, from the perspective of the seven degree angle, this is opposite, this is hypotenuse, and this is adjacent. Now I know it seems like we've been using an awful lot of opposite and adjacent in these problems. Um, don't you worry there. There are some sine and cosine problems too. But uh, once again, we're using tangent of seven degrees and opposite is three and adjacent is X. Now, a little trick that I had when X shows up on the bottom, you don't multiply by three because that just makes things worse. Um, it's the guy on the bottom that you normally want to multiply by. Well, we, we can do this uh, the old school way. Uh, if I multiply by X, I now have X tan seven equals three. And if I'm going to divide both sides, I'm trying to get X by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by tan seven. And that means that X is equal to three divided by tan seven. And I'm going to use, uh, and don't please remember to use division on this. This is not multiplication. And the calculator says 24.4. That is the ground distance in miles. You know, all of the units were in miles, so we don't have to worry about conversion. I have seen problems where they talk about the plane is at so many thousand feet, and then how many miles is it from the runway? That's a conversion issue um, you know, on top of Sokotoa. All right. Now, law of sines, law of cosines. Um, and you get to, you know, this is not going to tell you which one to use. Now, the thing is, I have angle B and I have little b. I have little a and I have angle A in the problem. So that is probably a good setup for the law of sines. Sine of B over little b equals the sine of A over little a. And so when I cross multiply, I get 16 sine A equals 10 sine 25. Now I want sine A by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by 16 and sine of A is equal to this beast over here, which I'm going to divide um, basically, I'm going to do, you know, do the 10 times sine 25, close parenthesis, divided by 16, and get a decimal for that, and then come back and say second sign, second answer, you know, and, and, and pull that fraction into the, the sign and see what it tells me. Now, once I plug all of that in, that big fraction on the right gave me 0.264. And when I said second sign of 2 point, uh, 0.264, um, I got 15.3 degrees. All right, so angle A is about 15.3 degrees. Now, I want to, you know, we ran into this issue um, at any time that the decimal was less than one, that you actually were going to have two answers you needed to check. You needed to check 15 degrees, and you needed to check its supplement, which would be uh, 165 would be the supplement. Now, we're going to go over to the drawing, and we're going to plug in some things and just see what's there. Little b is 16, little a is 10. So here's, here's the way that we're thinking about this, is that the 16 is bigger than the 10. So angle b that's across from the 16 should be bigger than angle a, which is across from the 10. So it makes no sense for angle a to be 165. It actually makes more sense for it to be 15, because um, 165 across from the, a little 10 like that uh, is not going to make sense. 
I want to make that note over here. Okay. All right. So we do have to check that with law of signs like that whenever when we come across something where the, the decimal is less than one. All right. Now, this one is probably more suited for law of cosines because uh, the one formula that we could be using here would be c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab times cosine of big C. Because big C is what we're after. And so that's that's going to dictate the formula here. Big C on this end, little c on that end. So let's plug in what we got. That's 15 squared equals 8 squared plus 10 squared minus 2 times 8 times 10 times cosine of C. And so we'll get all of the numbers on the left side and cosine C on the right side, and then we'll do the inverse uh, second cosine button and figure out from there. All right, 15 squared is 225, 64, 100, 2 times 8 is 16, times 10 is 160. Now, 64 and 100 is 164. And then we're going to subtract 164 from both sides. And that's going to give us 61. And then we're going to divide by negative 160. And we're just going to take that fraction and do second cosine and plug that fraction in so that it would look something like this. Let's see what happens. And the calculator says that we're going to get 112 degrees, which I guess little a is 8. Little b is 10, little c is 15. It makes sense that your largest angle, because 112 is going to have to be your largest angle, is going to be across from your biggest side. So that much makes sense. All right, coming down the home stretch. Now let's rewrite some of these and see if we can simplify them. Um, the only way that I can add one to this is to make the denominators the same. So I'm going to say, all right, there's sine minus cosine over cosine plus cosine over cosine. That's one, right? Well, if they have the same denominator, now I can say sine minus cosine plus cosine over cosine. And these two guys are going to cancel out, which is just going to leave me with sine over cosine, which can be simplified to tangent of x. Now, let's see what happens with this guy. Cosine over 1 plus sine over 1 times sine over cosine. Now we're running into the same issue here. I can't add these two together unless they have the same denominator. I need a cosine in the denominator on this side, which means I'm going to have to do this. I'm multiplying it by one, so I'm not changing the value. But now I've got cosine in the denominator. Now look what happens when I put these guys together. I get cosine squared over cosine plus sine squared over cosine, which is cosine squared plus sine squared together over cosine. And you remember we had one of those identities that said that sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. 
and 1 over cosine is the same as secant. Now remember that we had sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. And we had that little rainbow thing going on where these were opposites. Sine over 1 is the same as, uh, and down here it's 1 over sine. They're, they're reciprocals of each other. All right, let's move on. All right, here we're identifying transformation. Um, the negative means that we're going to flip on the x-axis. The three means we're going to vertically stretch. Oh, wait a minute now, the, the, we're, we're talking about sines here, which means that it's basically your amplitude. Amplitude is three. We're going to shift down four. And then over here, we have to say period is equal to two pi over B, where this is B. And so that's going to be 2 pi over 6, which actually reduces down 2 pi over 3. So period equals pi over 3. Now, let's tackle the other guy. We have an amplitude of 9. That sine x over 3 is like saying sine of one third x. So we're going to come over here and say 2 pi over 1 third. Now remember I said that when you have a fraction on the bottom of a fraction like that, it's like flip it and multiply. It's like 2 pi times 3 over 1. You get 6 pi out of that. So our period is 6 pi and we're going up one. Okay, a couple more. Here we're going the other way. We're going from English to math. Um, it is a sine function. We're reflecting, which means we're going to start with a negative. I don't see any reference to an amplitude, so presumably the amplitude is one. Um, now, if the period is 4 pi, remember that the formula goes like that. And they're telling you that the period is 4 pi. So 2 pi over what gives me 4 pi? Well, if I do this, I can cross multiply. B would have to be 1 half for that to work. So this is going to be a 1 half x, or you can say x over 2. I'm okay with that. And then shift down 2. Okay. Here, we don't flip, but we do have an amplitude of 9. It's a cosine. Our period is 2 pi, which 2 pi over 2 pi is 1. We're just going to do cosine of x, 1x, and then shift up 1. And we're done with that one. Now, the last few problems, we have to find the amplitude period, the midline or vertical shift, and any other transformations. Did it flip or not? Now, here, we are starting from there at 6, and we are finishing up there at 2 pi. So this guy, first of all, because, uh, you know, the midline, it goes from 6 down to negative 2. That's 8 units. So 6 minus 4 would give me halfway. So this thing is going up 2. So we can say up 2. We can say that the amplitude goes from 2 to 6. That's up 4 units. Amplitude is 4. Oh, um, let's see now. We're not flipping. We've got the amplitude. The only thing missing is period. 
and it goes from, and the period is just 2 pi. We don't have to convert it uh, or anything like that. Now over here, it goes from positive 3 to negative 3, which means that there is no vertical shift. There's no vertical shift. There is an amplitude of 3. It goes up 3 units. It goes down 3 units. Now, it goes from here to here. It has a period of 6 pi. And it didn't flip, so we're largely done with that. Now, we're going to uh, go to uh, Desmos again and plug in these 10 numbers in the chart, and then we're going to make a projection for what would number 12 look like. You know, so these were the higher, high temperatures every day for 10 months, and these were the averages for each month. So he wants the average of the 12th month. So we're going to plug these into our chart and then uh, you know, scan ahead. Well, first of all, we have to figure out what kind of uh, uh, an equation is this. So let's flip over to this, and I'm going to go there. And I'm going to, first of all, that is what your dots look like. And it looks like they go down and up and down again. So my first guess was, let's do this as a sine wave. And, you know, we've got a 0.9379. Uh, you know, the fact that it goes down and up and down, uh, that's not going to fit any of the others. The sine wave is your best bet. So the next question becomes, what happens when I get to 12? And so I'm just going to scan along. Oh, there I passed 12. 12 is 45.04. And it just, it, it is, once you get the equation right, it is just that simple. Just scan along until you see the number. Now, if you have problems landing on just the right number, uh, try zooming in a bit. Uh, that may help a bit. Uh, uh, you know, zooming in on that spot. And it makes, you know, it, 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 uh, it just makes it easier. I'll leave it that way. All right, 45.04. So when we go back here, um, well, I guess. It only gave us two decimals, so we'll say 45.040. Um, but you look at, you know, what's going on with the rest of these. Um, you know, it looks like it went down to 42, then it went up to 66, and then it started going down again. And so it makes sense that it would keep going down. Now, you notice these first two or three numbers. Look at what happened with the graph. This 42 was considered, uh, 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 you know, of all of the parts on this, this was the one that was the farthest off base. So it makes sense that it would be more like in here, in this area, uh, by the time you got back to the 12th month. So that, that, you know, the answer makes sense there. And that should do it. Uh, good luck on the test this week.